So we come to the 23rd Sunday of the year, and I want to cast this homily in the context of um, evangelization um, and the healing of this deaf man with a speech impediment. I think uh, we, we have a paradigm or a kind of a picture of what's needed for us in terms of evangelization um, from teachings that come to us from this gospel. So with that in mind, we'll maybe call this healing to healing for evangelization, kind of as a general working title. Now, the gospel opens uh, with, uh, it, it sounds like a little bit like a travel log. Jesus left Tyre, uh, went down through Sidon, and crossed over the Jordan River, uh, north, of, probably north of the Sea of Galilee, and comes down into the region of the, uh, of the Decapolis. So let's talk a little bit about this. I, we, we shouldn't ignore the place, um, which is uh, not Jewish territory. This he's outside of the land of Israel. And um, up in Tyre and Sidon, that would be modern day Lebanon. And then when he comes across, he doesn't go back to in, into Israel. He goes down, uh, down the other side of the Jordan on the east side and comes into the region of the Decapolis, which if you got your Greek roots going, deca meaning 10 and polis meaning city. So it's, it's the area of the 10 cities, the Decapolis. And now these 10 cities weren't just any 10 cities. There were 10 cities that were under construction at the time as a kind of a chuspah, you know, kind of a pride. Uh, this was the Romans' way of saying to the Jews, our culture is better than yours. We, they built these grand cities in the Greco-Roman style, big colonnaded avenues and buildings and uh, and so on. And uh, the Jews kind of lived in little hovels and little villages and things like this, uh, much more of an agrarian culture and so on. And it was kind of the Roman way of, you know, sort of sticking it to them a little and saying, you know, we're, we're better than you are. Uh, look at our grand cities. And so uh, these, these cities were being built at the time. That's not to say they weren't already being inhabited. And so we find that Jesus goes there. Now, why do I say all this to you? All this territory is hostile uh, in some way to the Jewish people. Now, particularly, you think of Tyre and Sidon today, it's Lebanon. Now, um, Lebanon's changed a lot in my lifetime. When I was a young child, uh, there were a lot of Christians living up in Lebanon. It was a very modern cities and, and uh, quite a kind of a Western sort of motif. And then um, the, uh, there was a civil war, a terrible civil war, and largely the Christians were run out. And you have left there mostly Muslims and some of them very radicalized. And so you have a group called a Hezbollah and they're lobbying, you know, they and the Israelis are exchanging a lot of rocket fire and, and there may be a full scale war before we know it. So ah, the saga continues, right? So anyway, you see that this was hostile territory in Jesus time. Yes, but especially in our time. And uh, then the Decapolis was also hostile in the sense that it was a, a Roman attempt to draw Jews away from the Jewish way of life into the sort of Hellenistic culture. Now you say, why did they care? You know, we live in this pluralistic culture, blah, 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 you do you. But again, they knew there was a strong uh, need for people to buy into culture and religion uh, of the state to in order to hold them as, uh, you know, loyal and faithful. And uh, they were smarter about that than we are today. And um, so, enough said. But uh, nevertheless, so you see, this is all kind of what we would call hostile anti-Jewish territory. And Jesus goes there. So now here we are. Um, as we look at this man we're going to see in a moment who has a speech impediment and is deaf, that that man is us. But before we get there, I just want you to see that Jesus, the, the greatest evangelizer of all, doesn't say, oh, that's hostile, I won't go there, you know, they won't listen to me there. Um, he goes, and he preaches, and he teaches, and some listen, and a lot don't, but the point is that he goes. He sees these people as heirs to the gospel, and he wants to go there, like he went into Samaritan territory. He went a lot of places the Jews wouldn't go. He didn't play a saint. He got out of the comfort zone. He went to places where it was hard to preach the gospel. And this, of course, is a lesson to us as we look at this first teaching about evangelization from this gospel, that Jesus was willing to go to hostile territories. We are living in a hostile territory right now in the West. 
Uh, they speak funny words and languages that aren't ours. Things like transgenderism, gay marriage, or um, lots of terminologies and things that don't make a lot of sense. Um, and yet they can't define what a woman is. And, and so I'm being a little facetious, but not. I mean, this is, there's a lot of stuff going on. They call abortion women's reproductive health and rights. And they're using lingo and euphemisms and things. And their languages are this foreign. And the way they live their lives. Most people are not living their lives today in conformity to the gospel, or even if they are, they don't mind that others aren't. And there's a, there's just a kind of a wholesale falling away from the biblical and gospel narrative, the teachings of the church, and so on. We are increasingly living in a very foreign and even hostile a culture that snatches away a lot of our kids. And, um, you know, I think finally people are waking up to the idea that maybe I should be sending my kids off to these colleges. They come back I don't recognize them. Hmm? So again, this is, I, I, I'm trying to show you though, that the Lord doesn't say, well, I'm not going there. I won't. No, he goes there, but he goes there to preach the gospel, not to be converted to their way. So you see, the vision is, is, is for us to not necessarily flee the world. There are some who have chosen kind of the Benedict option, you know, which for some families and people, that's a good idea. That works. But for many of us, we're going to have to stay put here we're, but we are living in the Decapolis, we're, we're living in Tyre and Sidon, we're, we're off uh, in territory that is very foreign and very, in times, frightening and very hostile, even arrogantly so, toward our way of life and what we teach. But Jesus, seeing this, did not hesitate to go there. He went there, and, um, and he preached there. All right, he planted the seed of the gospel, right? That's lesson one, therefore, the place of this gospel. The next thing we see is there's a problem presented. There's a man who has a speech impediment, and he's, he's deaf. Now, I, I want to, this, who is this man? Well, you know, he's a historical figure. But the point is, if you're prepared to accept and remember that the gospels are not spectator sport. Now, well, look what Jesus did to some dude 2,000 years ago. You're that dude. I'm that dude. What he needs to do for us is... So we are this man with the speech impediment who is deaf. Mm -hmm. Now, you know the connection between a speech impediment and being deaf, but I want to work it backwards. Let's start out with the fact that he can't speak well. He has a speech impediment. It doesn't mean he can't make sounds or something, but he, he has, you know, as you know, people who've been deaf either all their life or most of their life have, have a difficulty forming words and talking in ways that we can understand because they've never heard uh human speech they're sort of trying to imitate what they see people doing with their mouth uh and it doesn't always work well okay enough said uh he has a speech impediment his tongue is tied so to speak well so is yours and so is mine now, i'm talking in the broad picture i don't know that every single one of you are as tongue-tied as someone else but generally speaking we christians today have become very tongue-tied we are very quiet in a world that's falling to pieces. And we're afraid to say something. We're afraid to speak out. We're afraid to preach or to teach. We're afraid. That's the main reason for our speech impediment. Um, let's talk about that more for a minute. I'll give you another reason in a moment. But we're just, we see all kinds of crazy stuff and say, you know, that's not the gospel. No, there are not 50 genders. No, there is not an alphabet soup. God made us male and female, and there is a, a biblical vision to marriage and family and a theology of the body that we receive from God that is of God, and we can't and shouldn't change it. But you don't hear Christians or Catholics out there talking like that much. Now, I'm not saying no one is. I am. Other, there's some other folks out there, but, you know, too many are quiet, quiet about this, silent. And not just lay people, clergy, bishops, popes. We're all hush hush. You know? And you know, um, the problem with this, of course, is if the world's in darkness, we can't look any further than our very selves in our own in our own, you know, Christian ch churches and denomination. You know, the, our, our Catholic denomination to see the cause, because Jesus didn't just say, "You're a light." Of, of the world. You are the light of the world. That is to say, his light must shine through us. And if it isn't, the world's in darkness. But who's to blame for all this stuff, you see? And um, I can just say to you that, uh, obviously, um, we are. 
This has happened on our watch. And I'm old enough to remember a time when we didn't have all these fundamental disagreements about really basic stuff. It certainly wasn't a rosy world. It never has been. But we didn't have the kind of confusion we have today. Uh, all right, enough said. But we're tongue-tied. The first reason is fear. Second reason, though, is we have a hearing problem. Now, this is why very often I already made this link. There are people with hearing problems have trouble speaking clearly for the obvious reasons. Now, how do we have a hearing problem? Well, we very often have been not heard the word of God well or effectively. We, you know, we got a, a hearing problem. Poor catechesis, hmm? poor formation in the faith. And this comes from different levels. It comes from the catechesis we've gotten directly from the church, whether in Catholic schools or in in uh, Sunday school, kind of CCD classes, all that stuff. Boy, I went through a lot of that. That was just a waste of time, a lot of it, you know, just poorly done, really just cheesy, dumb, kind of kumbaya. I, 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 when I went to the seminary in my 20, I don't know, 22nd, 23rd year, uh, I can tell you, um, I couldn't have told you all Ten Commandments going in. I could have come up with some of them, but I mean, that's terrible. I mean, all those years, I'm 22, 23 years a Catholic, and I can't tell you all Ten Commandments? I don't even think about things like the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit or, you know. Okay. So part of our speech impediment is that we haven't heard. We don't hear the gospel. Or we don't hear it effectively. But I'm going to move my fingers here and say, here's another problem. We go, la, 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 because we don't want to hear. That's a problem, too. It isn't just, well, they poorly catechized me. Maybe, but you know, I bet, I bet you if somebody did try to poorly catechize a lot of us, we would have said, I don't want to hear all that nonsense. That's not the, it doesn't sound like what's great, man. You know, that sort of stuff. And um, so either way, the point is whether we going this way, we got our own fingers in our ears going la, 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 or whether we we just haven't heard the gospel effectively, that because of that, we have a speech impediment. And so what is the Lord to do about this, you see? Well, let's continue on. We see the place of the gospel, foreign territory. There's a man who has a hearing loss and therefore a speech impediment. It's not his fault, probably, that he has a hearing loss, but he has one, and therefore he can't speak. So the Lord wants to work with him and heal him. Okay. Now notice what he does, the way he does it. So we, we, we want to look at then the, the picture of this healing. Notice, first of all, the Lord takes him away by himself, apart from the crowd. Crowd. The Latin word for crowd is vulgus. Where do we get the word vulgar? The crowd. See, if the Lord's going to heal our deafness and touch our tongues to speak, I wonder what he's got to do is get us away from the crowd. Well, like everybody's saying, man, you know, hey, come on, you know, and, uh, well, guess what? The crowd isn't living the gospel today, if they ever were. And we got to get away from the crowd. That's step one. Get them away from the crowd. Come away from this, you know, come away, you see, from all this, right? Um, and uh, the book of Revelation has the cry of uh, the, to get out of ancient Jerusalem. Come away, come out of her, my people, you see. Get away from that, you see. Get away from the crowd, the crowd in the pejorative sense, right? Uh, the crowd in our in our day and time, for sure, is not living the gospel. The crowd is, you know, making all this din and noise. You have it in the music. You, have, you know, the, the 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 movie stars and the sports heroes and all this are going yam 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 yam. And most of them ain't talking about the gospel. All right, our entertainment is full of violence and gratuitous sexual things that. It, the, the crowd is into, you know, illicit sexual union and confusion galore. And they love confusion because then nobody has to make a commitment. Oh, there's a lot of different opinions. Who's to say? See, this is the crowd. I know, just get out of there, man. Come over here. Come over here. So that's step one. He needs to get us out of the crowd. Step two, it's very picturesque, isn't it? He puts his fingers in the man's ears. And, um as if he's putting his own word in there, like almost by a infusing knowledge, infusing knowledge into him. And then spitting, he touches the man's tongue, as if to say, from my mouth to your mouth, uh, the word of God. 
I place my, my words in your mouth and in your ears. That is to say, into your mind and your heart and on your tongue. And I heal you. Come away from the crowd so I can heal you. So let's look at the symbolism of this. First of all, to hear God's word, we have to get away from the crowd. Satan is yelling and blaring. It's on the microphone, just loud. It's proud. It's light, flashing lights and all kinds of loud stuff. God whispers, come away, come away. And he wants to put his word in our heart and our mind. So step one about how we begin to let the Lord go to work and put his ears, I mean, put his hands, fingers in our ears, if you will, put his word in our ears, is that we can come aside and pray. And of course, the best way to hear God, paradoxically, is to use our eyes and read his very word. So pray scriptures, study them carefully, listen to them. Let that be a regular part of your life, away from the crowd. Okay. We also see that there is here um, that he, he, he puts his words in the man's mouth and tongue. Now, he does this again, certainly in private prayer, but here too, don't miss the sort of reference to Holy Communion in the liturgy. Because it's not just private prayer, and kind of a Lexio Divina, a, a, a devout reading of Scripture, but rather it is that, but it's more, it's the liturgy. And you know, the liturgy isn't just supposed to be some ceremony or some ritual we go through. It's supposed to be a transformative experience. And if you let it be, it will be. And you, the word of God gets into you. And you, you hear the word of God proclaimed at the liturgy and you receive the living word of God. Jesus, the word made flesh who enters your very, your very body. And so these are the things that aren't, aren't just rituals, but rather they're meant to transform us so that we become what we eat, that we, we begin to reflect and speak what we've heard. And this is very much at work in the liturgy. Hmm? We're worshiping God, to be sure, but as uh, Dietrich von Hildebrand and some of the great theologians uh, down through the centuries have tried to remind us that the liturgy is supposed to mold our personality. Now, I can only give the example of my own life to say that I wasn't very serious about my spiritual life until I was in my 20s, my early 20s, when I went to the seminary. Up until that time, I was kind of vague. You know, I went to church, but I was an organist and a choir director, you know. I had to. I know it sounds terrible to think I wasn't always on my knees and devout, even as a choir director. It was a job, and I liked it. it was, but it wasn't that I was really serious. But when I finally got serious and entered the seminary, I started going to Mass every day and going to confession once a week and praying every day for at least an hour. And these habits and patterns have continued. And of course, the Sunday liturgy with the larger congregation, as well as the daily liturgies with the smaller congregation. And over all these years, I'm a very changed man. I, I don't preach like I started out preaching. I was more timid and quiet and shy. I, I, I don't preach uh, that. Like I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I'm, I've been the word of God is more because it's come into my ears and my heart and my mind. And now I'm, I'm more loquacious than ever. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Uh, for, for, he's not, I'm not given for brevity. Okay, I, I get that. But, but the point is that um, my life is different. I have different priorities than I did in my 20s. I'm in my 60s now, for, so for 40 some years of really being serious about both liturgy and prayer, coming away from the crowd, coming out of that through the narthex of the church into the church and being among the faithful and celebrating the liturgy and the sacraments and hearing the word and preaching the word. And I'm a changed man. My heart and my mind are different. The Lord put his words into my ears and spitting touched my tongue from his mouth to mine, in the Holy Communion and so on. This is what the Lord has done, and I'm a changed man. And that, my brothers and sisters, is how this gospel can be fulfilled. Now, I want to find in on one final thought, and then just go back to this link to evangelization, because you see, this man, who is you and me, is being equipped to better evangelize, to come out of fear and out of ignorance, to the word of God and, and come into a clarity about the word of God and then begin to speak it and announce it by the way we live and by the way we live and speak. Now, there comes this moment where it says, after Jesus did this, he, be, he, he could hear and he spoke, it says here in the text, our translation, he spoke plainly. 
The Greek word is a little more, it's a little better than, it's, it's orthos. The Greek word here, he spoke orthos. And we get the word orthodoxy. We get the word orthodonix or orthodonist. What is an orthodontist who makes your teeth straight? <laughs> um, they go from being crooked to being straight. Uh, so orthos means straight. So ortho, orthodoxy is to have straight, clear, pure doctrine. And so he noticed, to, to use this analogy then, with the Greek word here, he spoke not just plainly so that people could understand what, the meaning of the words, he spoke the truth. He spoke it clearly, straightforward, purely. Orthos means straight, good, good, clear, you know, truthful, in accordance with the truth. You see, that's the real gift. It isn't for simply that he can go from going, oh, blah, blah, whatever, however he spoke, to speaking so that people could understand his words. That's a miracle, because he'd never heard or had seldom heard. But now he does. But on the other hand, what's really beautiful is that he's speaking the truth. See, you can get your speech repaired if you've got a stuttering problem or something, go out there and just gossip and lie and pass on misinformation. And that's, that's, that's not even, that's, that's no good. In fact, it's, it's terrible. The, the real glory is when your speech and my speech start to glorify God and proclaim the truth in season and out of season. Okay, so here we have a gospel that you might not originally think has anything to do with evangelization. But it does. The Lord is willing to go to a hostile place and preach this word, and he needs people to be converted and help him. And one man he goes to, where it's brought to him, it, it seems like the least likely candidate to preach the gospel. He's got a, he's deaf and he has a speech impediment. But that one is you, that one's me. You, you and I are the least likely person on the planet to be able to do this well. But the Lord goes to us anyway. He's willing to go to hostile territory. And he's going to find some disciples there and anoint and appoint them and plant that seed of faith. And this man, this is you, this, you know, we are, we are, you and I, male or female, we are this man. And he wants to work with us. And so in so doing, he wants to get us away from the crowd. Stop listening so much to the crowd, okay? And then put his word, his word, not their word, his word in our ears and Touch, and touch our tongue and undo our tongue so that we can speak without fear and with a clarity and a knowledge that comes from God and from our prayerful relationship with him in private prayer, but also especially in the liturgy. And then what he wants us to do is speak the truth clearly, orthos, in a straightforward way without bending the truth or playing around with it, but just orthos, straight, clear, Lane. All right, are you ready? See? There's an old song maybe I'll just finish with. I won't sing it, but um just says, Hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. Oh my Lord, my Lord, what shall I do? says that spiritual. In other words, hush, Jesus wants to take you away from the crowd. We're in hostile territory, y'all, but the gospel still needs to be preached. And he's taking us away from the crowd. Hush. Let him talk and put his word in your ears in prayer and liturgy away from the world and touch your tongue and then send you back to speak orthos, to speak orthodoxy. So it doesn't look like it's a gospel about evangelization, but it is. Praise be Jesus Christ and may the Lord's blessing be upon every one of you who take the time to listen to these long talks. God bless you all.